a greetings. This is John Savers on World War II. My name is John Savers. I'm your host. Uh, and today we will inaugurate this particular series uh, with the hopes of making a um, dent in the, um, the perception of this war in America uh, which we think is askew. Now, we, we think that the reason this is so uh, is uh, part of vanity. Uh, we against them, and we are the good guys, and they are the bad guys, and so forth. A concept which has been grotesquely reinforced uh, by movies, print, the media in general. Uh, this is sanctioned, certainly, by the establishment. Uh, there have been uh, no efforts whatsoever uh, on the part of, um, of Congress, for instance, to ever try to um, uh, find the truth uh, in regard to certain areas which are controversial. Um, but uh, if they will not do the job, uh, then others will have to do it. Uh, it's uh, simply a matter that the truth has to come out. Now, it is our intention uh, to be objective. Uh, however, we will present uh, information uh, which uh, bears the perspective uh, of the German forces. Uh, in this particular film, which we'll used to inaugurate this series uh, is a case in point. A, um, a general uh, who was familiar with Adolf Hitler, uh, who had talked to him, who had some understanding of him on a personal level as well as a strategic level, uh, something which your academics uh, here in America don't, uh, will have this particular man, General de Grill, is the uh, guide, uh, and he will discuss a certain aspect of the uh, German uh, fighting uh, effort, uh, the mode of fighting, uh, and uh, we uh, hope that you get a better understanding of that. It will be from uh, their perspective. You will have a chance to understand um, the f how, it, how it came into being, its genesis, and so forth. Speaking of which, uh, the genesis of this program uh, is one which is based upon a kind of irritation with material omissions and misrepresentations um, by our side. Uh, I, I think that um, the demonizing of Adolf Hitler uh, and subsequently, the uh, entire regime uh, is a huge error, uh, and one that is basically perpetrated by people who, for the most part, consider themselves atheists, materialists, intellectual, uh, and so therefore it's rather incongruous uh, that they are out demonizing. Uh, but uh, that is the case. We are going to uh, try to remove the image of demon. Uh, Hitler, for instance, was not a demon but a visionary. Uh, it is not necessary that he be right in all ways. Uh, it is only uh, important that he be correctly uh, portrayed uh, in his regime correctly portrayed. The German people are kith and kin, for the most part, if we are Anglo-Saxon and so forth. Um, there's no reason to declare them a demon unless we wish to declare ourselves to be demons also. Uh, a Hitler was for a brief period at any rate, win or lose, uh, and his legacy, whatever it would be, would be brief. But at any rate, uh, it was, in point of fact, uh, perceived at least 
as an impediment uh, to the evolution socially of the world uh, and uh, therefore um, something which had to be greatly discouraged by misrepresentation. Don't want another one of those popping up. So uh, anyway, let's go forward uh, with our initial episode. When on September 1st, 1939, war erupts on the Polish frontier, an earth-shaking revelation will astonish the world public. And what is it? It is the revelation of a form of military genius that completely transforms the strategy and tactics of the past. Until then, in fact, the leading of armies had changed little. The volume had merely grown as a result of the French Revolution and Napoleon. The drafting of the general public into the army had quantitatively transformed the problem. As for the rest, the modifications had not been extraordinary. The percussion cap rifle had been discovered. The means to replace cast iron by steel had been found. The German steelmaker Krupp had invented the modern gun carriage that assured the German victory in 1870. Rifles had also been improved. Instead of hitting their target at 100 meters, they could now hit their target at 1,000 meters. Even the machine gun had been invented. But ultimately nothing had come along to sweep aside all the calculations. Suddenly there surges forth a man who will completely transform the military problem across the world. And this man is Hitler. One might have thought that nothing predisposed him to such a discovery. For four years, he had been a simple soldier, then a corporal. There were already thousands of generals in the world imbued with their science, believing they possessed the absolute and unavoidable truth. And their truth consisted of what? Handling millions of men. They were all in agreement on that. Whether it was one million or two million or five million. They were immense masses on whom one stuck a uniform in whose hands one planted a rifle and whom one sent off then in enormous herds to the border. And all this in the midst of considerable material complications because they calculated 
that it took 15 to 20 days to put these masses in motion. And now there surges forth a man who in place of these interminable delays, this quasi-immobility is going to substitute an almost lightning-like mobility, a rapidity which surmounts in a few hours all the obstacles. He who invented this transformation of military strategy and tactics was Hitler, and he transformed them. He reached this result with a confidence in himself that was absolutely astounding. He'd had hardly any chance to try out his system. There had been a short rehearsal at the time of the entry into Austria. He had succeeded in getting his armored troops still still few in number to traverse almost 1,000 kilometers in two days. The entire world at that time made fun of him. They said a mass of tanks stayed broken down en route. He created some unbelievable traffic jams. And almost no one realized that in fact these troops, few but extremely fast, had arrived on time at their goal. A certain number of tanks had indeed had some problems en route. The main mass had arrived in Vienna within the time allotted. It was of an extraordinary rapidity. But aside from Austria, there had been no rehearsal. However, Hitler is so sure that with the new strategy he will put into play, that he will succeed instantly, that in advance he himself fixes the dates for success. He establishes himself in how many days he will have succeeded in the operation, in how many weeks a campaign will be terminated. It is almost stupefying because ultimately what he invented is the simultaneous utilization of powerful armored land forces and powerful aerial forces. Never before had this been done. The English at the end of the First World War had utilized a powerful grouping of tanks, tanks which were still fragile. But the English had never united these armed forces with aviation. And never had anyone employed 400, 2,000, or 2,500 planes all at once. And Hitler, in his mind, in his mind alone, imagined the simultaneous deployment and on a large scale of these two forces which until then had never been deployed together. And the war erupts and events take place mathematically as Hitler foresaw. What did he foresee? He foresaw the basic thrust of this strategic operation, huge envelopments using tanks in large units preceded immediately by an air force which crushes all before it. But he employs them in huge operations in which two immense arrows arc toward each other and join behind the adversary's back. Well, in three days, the first operation of this kind 
totally succeeded. Danzig and the Polish corridor were wrapped up by the tanks and the air force descending at the same time from East Prussia and from Posen. Danzig and the corridor are here. The two arrows come together in this zone. Danzig and the Polish corridor and all that is in between are squeezed shut in a couple of dozen hours. An absolutely sensational result. And by the way, the German staff, the old generals who were against tanks, who did not believe in them, had at the most been willing to tolerate an operation of this kind near the Baltic, below Danzig in the Polish quarter. But Hitler was looking farther ahead to do such an operation on a much vaster scale. Once he had assured himself of Danzig in the corridor, which had been the object of local conflict for 21 years, he launched two other arrows, one coming this time again from the Baltic and East Prussia, and the other rising up from the south, that is to say, from the new regions occupied by Germany in Austria in one direction, from Bohemia in another, but mostly from Slovakia. So the troops, mounting from the south, the troops tumbling down from the north, especially armored troops and aviation, give themselves over to a gigantic operation for three more days. And the 6th of September, the war only started on the 1st, these huge forces already find themselves 50 kilometers outside of Warsaw. And that's not all. A third movement, and even vaster, imitates the same double movement, closing in back of the last Polish troops at the river called the Bug. And there you have it. In less than two weeks, Poland, in fact, is annihilated. And they had had 750,000 men for resisting. And they had been certain of arriving in Berlin in one week on horseback. Beck and his whole entourage had put out the most terrifying declarations with the dangers that menaced the Germans. It was a question only of the physical condition of the horses for them to arrive on time and meet up the French and the Poles on the streets of Berlin to have their horses drink their fill from the Spray River. And instead of that, all these grandiose projections are obliterated. It was thereby proven that elite troops obeying new strategic laws are capable in small number of liquidating the huge military masses of the past. This liquidation will attain gigantic proportions. Not only will a significant number of Poles perish in this combat, but also 700,000 will be taken prisoner. 700,000 prisoners already, an enormous net. And what's more, as we shall see, 200,000 others escaped, only to fall into the hands of the Soviets. And what are the losses of the whole German army? There were not just tanks in the Air Force, there were also the conventional forces. The classic infantry that accompanied them. But even there, if at this stage there are only six armored divisions, there are ten motorized divisions.
Hitler wants his shock troops to be followed immediately by troops on trucks. The soldier will no longer be the poor grunt crushed under his load, trudging with 30 kilograms on his back and his winter greatcoat in the middle of summer, plus his weapons. So he will put them on trucks. Ten divisions are mounted on wheels. They don't have to lug their baggage, which provided an extraordinarily useful mobility for the accompanying troops as well. This lesson should have enlightened all the great military leaders you see that a conflict has erupted which can lead to gigantic extremes. Everyone should tell himself, I need to study this phenomenon. But no one pauses or even comprehends. Not among the old German generals either, who are still with their cavalry and their troops, mentally marching wearily hundreds of kilometers. But for the French, it's the same story. Gamelin will learn not one lesson from this experience and will perish for his ignorance a few months later. No, no, there's only one thing at this moment which draws their attention. It is that at the last moment, the Russians just entered the war. And again, this should have led not only the strategists, but also the politicians to some important reconsiderations. The Russians had concluded a friendly accord, but one which above all had been dictated by the circumstances to Hitler and Stalin. But nothing was known of their secret accords concerning Poland, the Baltic States, and Romania, which corresponded, by the way, to the secret accord that the English and the French had similarly offered, or at least accepted. And at the moment, when Hitler is about to liquidate all of Poland, see how quickly, but really right away, it's just the 12th of September, the Soviets pounce, supposedly, to liberate the people of their stock, who were located on Polish territory, that is, the Galicians, or more precisely, the Ukrainians, around six million people, who had been included in the unified Polish state in 1918. And in fact, it is admitted, although it was France who declared war, for it is she who declared it, not Germany. France declared war because Hitler wanted to bring back in the inhabitants of Danzig, 99% Germans, who for 21 years had been waiting, two to 300,000 persons, to rejoin their country. France had declared war over that, but now the Soviets were rushing forth in a gigantic invasion from the east of Poland, seizing millions of persons. And France did not react. But basically, was she sincere or insincere? From the English and French point of view, if Hitler was guilty of touching a part of Poland populated by Germans, Stalin was all the more so in grabbing millions of persons when he had not been provoked at all and nothing had happened to justify the attack. Well, the English didn't make a move, nor did the French make a move. 
from this one can see all the hypocrisy in their theatrical declaration of war. This war was implacably wanted, was based on the crudest of lies. And when the moment comes to show good faith to an ally, they back down. And by the way, from the very first day, the English and the French back down. Poland can plead all she wants for someone to come to her aid, but it will take three days of waiting for England and then dragged along in her wake France just to declare war. Already at that moment, there is no more Danzig or the Polish corridor. As I've explained to you, on the 3rd of September, it's already over. It makes no sense to make war. But this declaration of war was obviously a declaration of nothing at all. Well, that's it, folks. A wrap. We're out of time again. This is John Savers on World War II. My name is John Savers. I'm your host. I'm glad you could join us, and I hope to see you again next time on John Savers on World War II.